Radio Mises, avsnitt 77. Denna gång med en gäst som inte behöver någon introduktion överhuvudtaget. Vi har fått tag på ingen mindre än Peter Schiff som har erbjudit sig att tala med oss om ekonomin och blandade ämnen en stund. Men vi ska väl introducera lite på svenska först kanske. Hej Klaus! Hej Hans! Det här är ett väldigt roligt avsnitt för att Peter var en av de personer som gav mig första stegen på vägen mot ett bättre vetande. Ja, väldigt många har ju sett den berömda Peter Schiff was right-videon som cirkulerade 2009-2010 där någon hade klippt ihop alla hans prediktioner som blev sanna. Mm, och det var han som började lära mig tänka. Jag följde hans nyhetsbrev eh, som kom ut veckovis. Jag kommer ihåg att jag längtade efter varje fredag när det här skulle komma ut. Jag, mm. jag tyckte de var så fulla av märklig klokskap. Som till exempel, det, han gjorde hål på en del myter som att en svag valutakurs skulle vara bra och sådär. Och det här var så upp- och nervända revolutionerande tankar så att jag, ja, ja. till slut så hittar jag den här informationen i den österrikiska skolan men i början så var det han som gav mig no, Jag brukade lyssna på hans tidiga radioprogram som hette Wall Street Unspun som var ett sån här investerarprogram men det övergick väldigt mycket att prata om ekonomin det här var ju också precis efter kraschen då, förra finanskraschen Sen har han ju kört radio, syndikerad radio och nu kör han väl en veckovis Shift Radio. Det är inte dagligen längre. Han är ju spännande Peter Schiff för han har ju alltid varit före sin tid. Långt innan bostadsbubblan briserade så pekade han på vad som var på gång. Det finns en annan jättefin video från 2006 eller någonting där han är på en konferens för... Jag tror att det är mortgage brokers, alltså, alltså folk som, som pendlar fastighetslån i USA. Där han förklarar hur hela marknaden kommer att implodera. Och sen på slutet då så är det någon som säger på Men vad tycker vi ska göra för någonting egentligen? Och han säger någonting i stil med, ja, well you can sort of pack up and go home. <laughs> um, han förklarar att hela marknaden för, för fastighetsobligationer, fastighetslån kommer totalt krascha i USA. Det här gör han något år innan den totalt kraschar. Mm. Uh, nu har han gjort många prediktioner sedan dess och absolut inte alla har slagit in. Han hävdar ju fortfarande att de inte har slagit in än. Och det är ju så, det är svårt att ha före sin tid. Vi får väl se om han har rätt den här gången, men har han det så är det ju ganska dystra tider för USA framåt. Han har ju alltid varit en stor en, en, en goldbug. Och det ja. är han ju fortfarande. Jo, och alla som har varit goldbugs, jag har väl också varit tyckt att guld är en bra grej ganska länge, har ju fått... Uh, Hör en del tråkiga ord från 2011 till 2015. För guldpriset har ju gått ner. Det har ju sett ut som börsguld går ner, börsen går upp. Allting är guld och gröna skogar. Och ja, så ser det ut när man är i en så kallad högkonjunktur. Men det är ju vad som händer i slutändan som spelar roll. Mm. Så vi får väl se. Han har ju skrivit en del böcker också. Jag, vet, jag tror att jag äger Crash Proof ägas med hans bok som skrevs innan finanskrisen 2008. Um, sen har jag skrivit en lustig liten bok tillsammans med sin bror som vi har nämnt förut som heter How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes som är en illustrerad förklaring hur en ekonomi fungerar just det, en trevlig liten bilderbok ja, och sen hans senaste bok skrev han för en tre år sedan tre, fyra år sedan och uppdaterades för ett par år sedan som heter The Real Crash som då handlar om vart USA är på väg när den här cykeln är över i princip mm. uh, men det finns mycket material där ute med Peter Schiff som är väldigt väldigt Bättre att kolla på. En av de bästa sakerna är ju faktiskt hans Henry Hazlitt Memorial Lecture på Mises institutet i USA. Där han förklarar sina prediktioner efter hur han kunde se det han ser och det som hände under finanskrisen. Ja, och där han förklarar varför USA aldrig kommer att betala tillbaka sin, sin statsskuld. Nej, det är man, ganska... Man viker sig dubbel när man ser den där. Jo, men det, den, är, den är jätterolig. Det, det... Det är en ganska kaxig föreläsning. Han är ju lite kaxig, Peter Schiff. Han sa, why everyone should have seen this coming. Men han följer ju väldigt logiska, stringenta resonemang. Det är ju bara det att, som sagt, allting syns ju inte omedelbart. Mm. Det är ju lite som vi har suttit och pratat om eventuell bostadsbubbla i Sverige. Vi är ju ganska övertygade om att vi förr eller senare får rätt. Men ingen kan ju riktigt säga när det spricker och så vidare. Men enligt teorin att det är i princip aldrig annorlunda den här gången så... Så kan man göra vissa prediktioner och sen får man ju bita ihop med som man visar sig ha fel under den period man har. Ja då. Men vi ska bjuda in Peter Schiff här i studion och så ser vi hur många frågor vi hinner få in på den lilla tid som vi har fått oss tilldelade. Ja, det blir ett alldeles utomordentligt avsnitt. Så varsågoda! Vi 
with us today, we have none other than Austrian economist and investor, Mr. Peter Schiff. He is famous not for not only predicting the financial crisis of 2008-2009, but also correctly pinpointing why it happened. He is the author of several books, most recently The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy. He is also the president and CEO of Europe Pacific Capital. Welcome, Peter. Oh, well, thanks for welcoming to, me to your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, always, uh, also Klaus. Hello, Klaus. Hello, Hans and Peter. Hello. So... We thought we'd ask you a little bit about, you know, the state of the world economy, where you think we're heading and so on. Um, perhaps we should start with the United States. Um, how are things in the United States, you know, economy wise? Well, I think they're actually pretty bad. You know, that, you know, we, we, we've had interest rates at zero percent for seven years for a reason. Uh, and it's not because we have a healthy economy. And the Fed has uh, done three rounds of quantitative easings for the same reason to cover up a sick economy. But the reality is everything the Fed has been doing has prevented the economy from healing. See, rather than allowing the market uh, to help restructure the economy along the lines that might ultimately lead to healthy economic growth, something that's sustainable, in order uh, to avoid the political embarrassment of having to go through a painful restructuring, instead, we've had the Federal Reserve that has really administered the equivalent of monetary heroin so that we don't have to go to rehab. We could just get high as a kite again, and the voters can be fooled into believing that the economy has actually uh, you know, been nursed back to health when it is, in fact, sicker than ever. But when was the last time we had a healthy economy? And how do we know if we had one? Well, it's hard hard to say. I mean, we've been doing this uh, since Greenspan, certainly. I mean, Greenspan started this type of monetary policy, which was distorting the economy in the 1990s. Uh, so certainly uh, it dates back to then. But, you know, the more, you know, like the more drugs that you take, the sicker you get and the more addicted you get and the more drugs you need to stay high. And so this has been going on for a long time. And so the economy is really, really screwed up at this point. And, and, and what, how, how does that look? How can we see the screwed upness of the economy? Well, you see it in all the imbalances, right? You see it in our trade deficits. You see it in our lack of domestic savings. You see it in our government uh, deficits, the national debt, the annual budget deficits. Uh, it's all over the place. And of course, it's it affects the entire world because the dollar is the reserve currency and all of our excess money printing is affecting economies around the world. You know, when Americans have money to spend, that affects all these foreign nations that supply us with all the goods that we're buying. But these are misallocations because Americans are going around the world spending money that they don't actually have. And, and so now the whole world becomes dependent, in theory, on American consumers, yet American consumers have no real purchasing power. They can only spend what the world is willing to lend them. So you have this giant global vendor financing scheme, but we're also screwing up monetary policy all around the world uh, because we've exported our inflation and we've exported our low interest rates around the world. And so everybody's monetary policy is screwed up. Everybody's economies uh, end up having all sorts of bubbles and misallocations of resources, but it's all rooted in the mistakes that are being made here in the United States because whatever we do as the issuer of the reserve currency has you know, repercussions around the world. What the world needs to do is, is, is basically go cold turkey on this. They need to allow the dollar to collapse, stop trying to prop it up, and then that will enable the global economy to heal and, and not you know, be dealing with these kind of imbalances. Sounds like you're describing Sweden. Yeah. Do you think the word world could go cold turkey? I mean, sort of detach from the dollar and, you know, start doing a dramatically different monetary policy than the United States. What would happen if the rest of the world said, well, no, sorry, we're going to raise interest rates because we think this is starting to look really bad and the U.S. can do whatever they want. What happens then? Well, the dollar would collapse because we can't raise interest rates because we have too much debt. So interest rates have to stay low to benefit the United States because that's the only way that we can pretend that we're still solvent. But if you take America out of the equation, the world is better off because, you know, what, what we all want is more stuff, right? It's not about consumption. It's about production. And the more you produce, the more you get to consume. And if you look at America, we are net consumers, which means we take out more from the global economic pot than we put in. And that means that the rest of the world collectively 
has to take out less than they put in. So, you know, we're living off of the hard work of everybody else. And so if America was just removed from the picture, the net result would be the rest of the world would have more. Right? They could either work less or enjoy uh, more consumption uh, because they would no longer be supporting the United States. So the world has a lot to gain by changing uh, this dynamic. America, of course, has a lot to lose because we're getting a free ride on this global gravy train. But from my perspective as an American, I recognize that this free lunch is not going to go on forever. And the longer it takes the world to figure this out and end it, the worse it is for America. Because all along, our economy continues to degenerate and we become more and more dependent on the world so that when the world finally wakes up and basically, you know, uh, kicks us out and we have to go cold turkey, we have a bigger habit that now needs uh, to be kicked. And so now the withdrawal is worth. So I, for me, the sooner the better, because I know it's inevitable. It's not going to happen forever. Uh, and so I'd rather it happen sooner before we destroy even more of our economy uh, in the process. Do you have a timeline for this? Well, I mean, I don't. I think it's already, you know, taken longer than I would have thought. I mean, we're living literally on borrowed time. And I think what's happening now in the global financial markets is another indication that the time may be near. I think the time was very near in 2008, 2009, and the world made the wrong decision back then. Instead of, you know, cutting the ties and allowing America to have its day of reckoning, uh, the world responded once again by slashing interest rates, buying more dollars, monetizing our debt. And so they extended uh, the, the day of reckoning. And now, of course, there's a lot more to reckon with. And so hopefully this time, uh, this will be the last time. And I think with the interest rates around the world already at zero and major central banks already doing quantitative easing, it's going to be hard to back up the truck again when the truck is already backed up and it, it's pretty much can't take any more you know, in the load. But why is the world playing along? Is it stupidity or is it some evil going on here? That's the, always the well, big question. Well, but a lot of it, a lot of it is just about preserving the status quo and not rocking the boat. And of course, you know, there are a lot of vested political interests that want to see the status quo maintained because they profit from the status quo. Uh, businesses and industries have evolved around, uh, you know, this relationship where America borrows and spends and the world uh, consumes, and, I mean, produces and saves. And so a change would upset the apple cart. And so the people that are benefiting from the apple cart don't want that. And so they make donations to the politicians and they try to preserve the status quo. So some of it is that and, and some of it is, yeah, legitimate misunderstanding of economics. I mean, you have so many people around the world that that still believe in all this Keynesian nonsense and, and they think that uh, consumption is the driver of economic growth and inflation is a is, is beneficial and like kind of the secret sauce that makes the economy go and we need inflation and we need spending and and savings is evil you know and underconsumption is bad and you know so th you know it's all kind of a an Orwellian uh, concept where the government convinces you that you know what's bad is good and what's good is bad in order to perpetu perpetuate uh, you know that what, what they're trying to perpetuate. Beer, your last book was uh, the real crash, and obviously you're not talking about the the financial cra cra crisis of 2008 2009. You're talking about the coming crash, and um, and I mean every as soon as we exit a recession, everybody thinks, oh, now there will be, never be a recession again and everything will just be fine. Uh, we see this a lot in Sweden. They are, they're always planning for no recession ever in the future. And at the same time, the situation seems to be getting worse. I mean, uh, the, the amount of debt in the system is a lot higher now than it was then. So, I mean, what happens the next time the U.S. goes into a recession? Well, you know, every time we get out of a recession, as a result of government interference and stimulus, we sow the seeds of the next recession, right? The business cycle in that respect is being caused by the government. And so when they use the artificial stimulus to, to generate a phony recovery, it's, it's inevitable that that phony recovery recovery is going to bust and it's going to usher in a, a, new, a new recession. And in fact, in that whole business cycle, the recessions are actually the healthy part of the cycle. 
That's where the free market is trying to correct all the problems that resulted from the last round of stimulus. And so what happens is the market tries to fix the problem, right, heal the patient, and then the government comes in and prevents that and does something to cause the patient to relapse, right, back into his, into his uh, you know, dr- drunken state or drug-induced high, and now we make more mistakes and we compound the problems, and now we go back into another recession. And I think where we are now, the recessions are going to get deeper and deeper because the amount of monetary stimulus necessary to revive Uh, The patient keeps getting more and more. And I've said that ultimately the end result is an overdose on all this and you destroy the currency. And that is the overdose of monetary stimulus is hyperinflation. And, 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 And that is, of course, the worst possible thing that an economy can endure uh, because you really destroy the value of the currency. That means it wipes out savings, uh, and it, it's a complete disaster. And then the economy can't function because you no longer have a legitimate medium of exchange. And then you have shortages. You have black markets. You have all kinds of bad things that happen uh, when a government destroys the confidence in the currency. But when it comes to a fiat currency, that's all you got is confidence, right? Because there's no real value. We're, no, we're not on a gold standard. Uh, so what gives money value is the perception that it's going to have value, the confidence in the central bank to limit its issuance and that people will always accept it. But once the confidence is gone, it's gone. And you really can't put it back. It's almost impossible. I mean, we're seeing this currently. We, we try to watch Venezuela a bit because uh, Venezuela has something like 720% official inflation, which means uh, the real inflation is even worse. And I mean, this, that is the end game for any currency that isn't kept sort of sound, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, the economy is contracting and there's lots of unemployment, which is, you know, your Keynesian oxymoron, because they all think that, you know, inflation happens in a strong economy. And if there's deflation, that means you have a weak economy. And and so they feel that creating inflation is positive. Well, if inflation is good, the more the better should be, uh, you know, what should be great then. Yeah, well, it should be leading the world in in economic growth and prosperity because they have so much inflation. Man, that people that's a pretty powerful incentive to go out there and spend, right? Prices, if you don't spend right now, prices are really going to be high. Um, We're actually but, hoping to find someone from Venezuela who can tell us what it's like and we can record that and see if it's true. Yeah, uh, although they'll try to see, they try to claim that, well, inflation of 2% is great. If it's 3%, that's bad. And if it's 1%, that's bad. It has to be 2%. And then it's like nirvana, which, of course, <laughs> makes no sense. It's either good or bad. If rising prices are good, then the faster they rise, the better, right? See, I think falling prices are good. And I think the faster they fall, the better, right? If I want to buy myself a new car next year, I'm hoping it's as cheap as possible. Everything I want to buy, I want it to be cheaper. Hell, if I can get it for free, that's even better. Right. So the cheaper, the better, as far as I'm concerned, if the price of the things that I want to buy is going up, that's not a good thing. Like like oil is going down. And that's good. And in fact, you know, they, 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 the politicians are trying to pretend that oil prices going down is bad. Well, I suppose if it was free, then it would be even worse. What if everybody could have what if oil just came out of your faucet like water? You had like hot, cold and oil. And you could just fill up your car for nothing. I mean, would would that be a problem for the global economy if you could have all the oil you wanted for nothing? Of course not. But, you know, the, the, the reason that oil is going down, though, is because of problems in the economy. It's not that falling oil prices are hurting the economy. No, it's the weak economies that are causing oil prices to fall. That's the problem. And you can't solve the economic problems by just forcing oil prices back up. Right. If it was that easy, all governments would have to do is put a tax on oil. Right, right. Governments can make oil as expensive as they want. Just tax it. But that's not going to solve the problem. That's actually going to make the problems that are causing oil prices to fall even worse. And what about gold? Yeah, gold. Maybe we should go into gold. Um, what about the gold price? It's been falling for the same reason. Well, it's not falling now. I mean, the price of gold since the Federal Reserve cut in raised interest rates in December, since the day after that rate hike, gold's right, risen over one hundred and twenty dollars per ounce. And um, and so gold prices are no longer falling. They're they're rising. And I think they're going to rise a lot faster. And in fact, before the price of gold started rising against the dollar, it was already rising against other currencies. I mean, look at the price of gold in terms of the Swedish krona, right? It's gone up a lot uh, in the past year or two, even as it was falling against the dollar. So I think now 
gold is rising against all currencies, uh, including the dollar. And I believe that gold is going to rise much further because the only reason that gold fell was because, A, it rose so much. I mean, people forget that gold was under $300 an ounce in 2000. And so the fact that it went from under 300 to almost 2000 is a huge move, right? Nothing goes up in a straight line. So a lot of people had profits when gold was 1800 bucks. And so there was some profit taking. But then gold got uh, caught up in the idea that interest rates were going to rise. The Fed was going to launch this new tightening cycle and those higher interest rates would be a bad for gold. And so that began fa- to get factored in to the gold price. Well, now that the Fed has actually raised rates, something that the market had been anticipating for ne- for several years, well, now what? Right? Now what do you anticipate? Because the rate hikes have actually started. Well, I think what the markets are now anticipating is the next easing cycle, because I believe this is going to be the shortest tightening cycle on record. In fact, it may even be one and done. The Fed may be doing a U-turn and cutting rates before too long and maybe even bringing them negative. And I was saying this before the Fed actually raised rates. I said that when the Fed raised rates, it would be a buy the rumor, sell the fact or sell the rumor, buy the fact, uh, as the case may be, and that gold would rise. And it has risen. And I expect it to rise a lot more. So if you're thinking about buying gold, you should buy it. Don't think, uh, just buy it. If you were waiting for higher, pro- lower prices, you know, we've already seen them. And now we're going to get higher prices. And, you know, this is a little bit different maybe uh, than consumer prices, because obviously when you're buying something that you're going to consume, you want the price to go down. But when you're buying go- something that you're going to save and spend in the future, like gold, then, then you want the price to go up. But you want to buy it before it does. Yeah. So, uh, but if, if gold fell when interest rates were low, and they're going to lower interest rates again. What's that going to do to gold this time? Well, I think it's still gold fell because everybody thought rates were going up. Gold, gold went up a lot when interest rates were cut. When the Fed slashed interest rates from 5% to zero, gold went from about 700 uh, to almost 2,000, right? That was a huge move up on the, orig- on the initial cut in interest rates and the launching of QE. When gold started to fall, it was when people thought quantitative easing was over and that the Fed was going to be raising rates. So gold was looking forward to higher rates, and that's why gold fell. Now gold is looking forward to lower rates again, and that's why I think gold is going to rise. But ultimately, when interest rates really do start to rise, I think that real rates are still going to fall because what affects gold is not the nominal rate of interest but the real rate. So even if interest rates go to 10%, but inflation goes to 20%, you're negative 10%. So that's still very, very bullish for gold. And I don't think you're going to get any real rate hikes out of the US until we have lots of inflation, even the way the government measures it in the CPI. And no matter how high the inflation actually gets, I don't think the government's going to get out in front of it you know, the way Paul Volcker did when inflation was running at maybe 10 percent, but he brought interest rates up to 20 percent. That's not going to happen. If inflation goes to 10 percent, we might only have interest rates of two or three percent, because if we were to move interest rates above 10 percent, well, that would be a complete economic implosion because we have so much debt. We couldn't afford to make the payments. So if we actually had to fight inflation, the U.S. government would have to default on its treasury bonds. Now, what would that do to the global financial market? I mean, think about what happens when Greece defaults. I mean, how many people own Greek bonds? I mean, it's nothing, right? Can you imagine if the U.S. government defaulted on treasuries? How many, I mean, there are trillions and trillions of treasuries owned all around the world. How many treasuries are owned in Sweden? I mean, this is, you guys probably didn't own any, any Greek bonds over there. Right. But you've got a lot of treasuries. So, you know, this would be big. I mean, and the government would have to default on all kinds of commitments. The government couldn't, you know, pay for all sorts of things. They couldn't pay Social Security benefits if interest rates went to 20 percent or 10 percent. They couldn't pay uh, pensions of government workers. They they couldn't even pay the salaries of the workers they still have. I mean, the government would be collapsing. We couldn't pay the troops. We couldn't sustain our, you know, our forces around the world. I mean, so this is would be massive. So it's I don't even think it's on the table. So it's just going to be a lot of inflation. And so gold's going a lot higher. Your theory is basically that 
since the government can't default, they will have to inflate. They can't raise interest rates, they can't default, so they must t- choose the third option, yeah. inflate until the de- debt load goes down, sort of. Yeah, I mean, default would be better, but default politically is something that nobody wants to consider because, see, that's like an admission that there's a problem when you actually default. Uh, if you just print money and then there's lots of inflation, you can blame that on speculators, you can blame it on OPEC or greedy businessmen. Yeah. But, you know, the government did default once before in the United States, so maybe they'll do it again. I mean, people think, oh, the U.S. government has never defaulted. Yes, it has. That's what we did in 1971 with Richard Nixon. See, people forget that the U.S. dollar used to be an IOU. It was an IOU for gold, right? If you were in Sweden and you had $35, you had a promise to be paid gold. The United States government promised that they would give you an ounce of gold for that 35 Federal Reserve notes. So that dollar was really a liability on the part of the government where they were obligated to pay the bearer gold. And what happened in 1971 is we defaulted. We told the world, we promised to pay you gold. You had an IOU for gold, but we're going to default. We're not going to give you any gold for your IOUs. All you have is a piece of paper. It now has no value. It used to have value because if you had 35 of them, we shipped you a valuable ounce of gold. But now if you have $35, you don't get anything. It's just like having, uh, you know, monopoly money. It's just a piece of paper. But, you know, we still will accept it in payment of taxes. So if you have any U.S. tax liabilities, you can you can you can pay your taxes. But that was, you know, that was about it. But the fact of the matter is we defaulted. And now all of a sudden, you know, the dollar was marked down. The dollar lost a lot of value in the 1970s. But, you know, the world still is holding on to it. But that's a precedent. We made a commitment and we defaulted on it. So defaulting. Uh, on on the treasury bonds default you know you know would be the same thing hey because we could tell people look we're not going to pay you for those treasury bonds but you're welcome to hang on to them you can do whatever you want you can still trade them around you could trade them with your friends you could you know you could use them we're just not going to redeem them in dollars but you can hold on to those treasuries right it's I the mean, same thing this is not a completely unlikely scenario because as i see it they will probably say if you default on treasuries, the entire financial markets implodes because everything is based on, you know, the treasury being low, low, uh, uh, not just low risk, not, not very risky it, and so it's, on. It's supposed so, to be zero risk. They call yeah. it risk free, risk free. So maybe well. maybe they'll just say we can't redeem them, but you can still trade them. I mean, I heard yeah. some crazy theory that Japan, J- J- Japan might do this, that they might extend their bonds to like 50 year maturity, no interest rate, and then they'll just keep swapping them so they never have to pay them. Yeah. I mean, they could, yeah, you, all you have to do is extend the maturity and make the coupon zero. I mean, if I, I mean, imagine if you could do that, there's no limit to how many bonds that you can, you know, it's like, what, what if, what if uh, I could write checks and the, the thing was nobody could ever cash them, but they were free to just negotiate them, right? So let's say I, I could give you a check out of my checkbook. I can buy something, right? And then I could say, look, you can't take it to my bank to get anything, but you could use the check to buy something from somebody else. Right. It's the greatest it, 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 policy scheme ever. Yeah. But then there's no limit to what I can do. If I can pull that <laughs> off, I can write all the I you know, I can write all the checks I want. It reminds me of the old joke where, you know, some woman, you know, bounced a check and you know the fa- the bank, you know, calls her up and says, You're bouncing checks. She says, What do you mean? I still have more checks in my book. <laughs> like, you know, you could just but this this is it. You could write all the checks you want under this under this system. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put past the governments to try to pull that off. And I wonder if the world would be dumb enough to actually go along with it. You know, one of the funniest clips on YouTube is when you explain to a bunch of I don't know if they were foreign or uh, Americans, anyway, why the US will never pay back its debt. You remember that episode? Was that when I was talking about the, t- 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 the Chinese? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, I think you're talking about my <laughs> talk. It's on the internet. It was a speech I gave, a Henry Hazlitt lecture. Right. Uh, that's pretty where, funny. Where I, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, it should be obvious. Well, certainly the foreigners, how can we pay? Because, you know, we can't, you know, we have to prioritize domestic payments, right? We, we're going to pay Americans. We're going to make Social Security payments before we're going to make interest payments uh, to the Japanese or the Chinese. They can't even vote in our elections. So why are we going to honor the commitments we made to them and renege on commitments we made uh, to voters? Because politicians are beholden to the voters, right? So at the end of the day, if they have to piss off a bunch of foreign creditors who can't vote, you know, that's not as bad as pissing off 
Americans who can vote. Yeah, we're going to have to link to that. Just, um, what, what's your view in Europe? What's well, going I mean, on there? What, what, what the euro? Is that viable? Well, I mean, you know, it, I think the, the euro has many flaws. And I've said that from the very beginning, you know, when they first launched it. And I said that the way it was structured, there's a lot of moral hazards in encouraging the member uh, nations to run up a bunch of debt. And there's not, you know, enough incentives to be fiscally responsible because the people who are responsible get punished and they end up subsidizing the profligate. And, you know, Germany understood this, but they didn't really have the political courage when push came to shove to actually try to do something about that implied moral hazard. So, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that ultimately the euro is going to fail. The experiment will not work. But I do think that the U.S. dollar currently actually has a bigger problem than the euro. And I think that the euro could outlive the dollar, you know, and everybody is, you know, is looking for the problem to be with the euro or the problem to be with the yen. But I still think there is a bigger problem with the dollar. And in fact, the demise of the dollar may breathe some life temporarily into the euro, which may be seen by many as a viable alternative or substitute. So the collapse of the dollar could end up generating uh, more support for the euro, uh, which would help you know, maintain uh, the value of the currency for a longer time period. What, what could be a trigger for the dollar? Then I will let Hansen. Hansen. For the for the demise or fast well, demise I think, of the dollar. I think the trim, I think the trigger is going to be the about face from the Fed. Because right? the Fed is the Fed knows that they have to do another round of quantitative easing and they have to lower interest rates. So they're just trying to figure out a graceful way to do it, to try not to lose face and and not to acknowledge that they made a mistake. And again, you know, raising rates wasn't a mistake. It was cutting them in the first place. Once they went to zero, it was impossible to raise them without ushering in a crisis. But see, they've been pretending all along that that wasn't the case. But they're going to try to figure out some excuse so that they can still pretend that what they're doing is helpful as they you know, do QE4 and, and, and negative rates potentially. But I think that will be the trigger for the collapse of the dollar. The question is, how long will it take to fully implode? I think that will you know, be a big turning point, but it could take several years before there's ultimately a dollar crisis. I think the dollar could be falling for several years before it gets to a crisis level. But when the crisis level is going to hit is when the decline of the dollar starts to be perceived as a problem in America, because initially it's probably going to be welcomed as a good thing, right? Oh, this is going to be great for our exports. And the, the weak dollar is going to cause oil prices to rise. And people will say, oh, that's a good thing. And it's going to mean the inflation rate is going to rise. And then we could say, oh, we dodged that deflationary bullet. So this is great. Now we don't have to worry about deflation. So initially, everybody is going to talk about a weaker dollar and higher domestic inflation as being a positive. But at some point, it's going to be too much of a good thing from the point of view of the public, uh, which is going to be suffering a diminished uh, standard of living. And there's going to be pressure on the Federal Reserve to raise rates to try to slow down the inflation. But the problem is the economy is still going to be weak. In fact, it still may be in a recession. And so the Fed is going to have this dual mandate between stimulating the economy and fighting inflation. And when it's either inflation or economic growth, they're going to err for growth and they're going to toss out their inflation mandate as if more inflation is somehow going to create economic growth. It won't. But they have this Phillips curve mentality that there's some kind of trade off between the two when there isn't. But the Fed is going to choose uh, the lesser of the evils. And in its, in, it, in its mind, it's going to be, well, we're going to choose to have more inflation. And that'll be like a catalyst because then the dollar will really start to fall. And then that'll kind of be a self-perpetuating spiral because as the dollar falls more, then inflation gets even worse, yet the government does nothing about it. So that's even more pressure down on the dollar and it spirals into the bond market. And now you get a, a run on treasuries and now the Fed has to buy those treasuries. So it has to print even more dollars to pay for them. And that's where you get this inflationary spiral and a dollar crisis, which is ultimately coming. Sounds not very pleasant. Uh, we know you're very busy, Peter, so I'm going to finish off with one quick question. Who was the worst Federal Reserve chairman or chairwoman ever? <laughs> well, you know, Ben Bernanke, I think, 
I mean, I don't know. It's a tough call between Bernanke and Greenspan. I mean, I think what Bernanke has done in his or did in his tenure was worse than what Greenspan did. But if it wasn't for Greenspan setting the precedent, we wouldn't have had Bernanke. It's like kind of like he wrote the playbook and then uh, Bernanke just added some pages, but to the same playbook uh, because the plays didn't work anymore because, you know, the problem had gotten so much worse because of what Greenspan did. So it's hard to say, you know, I, I used to joke that Ben Bernanke let Greenspan off the hook because he was no longer the worst Fed chairman ever. But I, I still, you know, it's hard to say. And, you know, whether or not Yellen can en- end up outdoing uh, Bernanke remains to be seen because we don't really know exactly what she's going to do because she did inherit the policies of Bernanke and Greenspan and she continued them, but she is trying to reverse them. But I, I don't believe she's going to succeed. I think she's going to uh, crank it back up again probably uh, on a much higher level than even under Bernanke. So I think we've got to wait until this whole thing is over to try to figure out just exactly which one was the worst. Uh, Because it might end up being Greenspan because he was the first and he started the the trend. And uh, but, um, you know, Bernanke certainly uh, did some uh, some pretty bad stuff. I mean, he was handed the baton and he really he really ran with it. And, and, and Greenspan was a gold proponent once upon a time too, right? Well, Wasn't he? he still he still is. I mean, in fact, he never stopped. I mean, that, that's why he was a hypocrite the entire time. I mean, so that's another that's another reason to say uh, Greenspan maybe was the worst because Greenspan knew better. See, Greenspan actually knew that ultimately his policies would end a disaster. I don't know if Bernanke was as smart. Certainly, Yellen is not. So they, they they could just be incompetent, but he was kind of devious and evil. Or maybe in Bern- in Greenspan, he just got corrupted. You know, there's an old Lord Acton saying that power corrupts and, you know, well, you get an ego. And maybe even though Greenspan believed in a gold standard, he somehow believed that he can one up gold, that he was so smart and his judgment was so correct that he could replace gold and he can actually do a better job than gold. It kind of all of the applause went to his head. You know, people called him the maestro and everybody loved him. And, and so he believed his own press. And so, you know, maybe he just acted irrationally uh, given the circumstances. But now that he's no longer in the limelight and he had some time to reflect, uh, I think he pretty much realizes the mistakes that he made and and he knows that we're all screwed. And that's why, you know, that's why he's saying that gold's going to go measurably higher uh, and he's kind of preparing people for uh, what's going to happen. And he's kind of trying to absolve himself from some of the responsibility by at least starting to, you know, forecast the problems that are going to be resulting as a result of what we've been doing. Can I ask uh, a random question? Um, who would you vote for? We don't generally, we don't normally... Uh, encourage people to vote, but uh, people are interested <laughs> well, in U.S. presidential elections for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I was going to vote for Rand Paul in the primary, but he dropped out. So uh, I don't really know. I don't really have a candidate that, I, that I'm all that excited about. I mean, there are some good things about Ted Cruz that I like, and there's some things about him that I don't like. I mean, there's some things I like about Trump, and there's things that I don't like. Um, but, you know, Rand was the only one that I was really enthusiastic about, somebody that I really knew personally and somebody that I trusted. But since I'm probably going to end up voting for Gary Johnson, who's going to be a third party candidate running for the second time as a libertarian. Now, I know that he has no chance of winning, so it's not like he's actually going to win. But I live in Connecticut. And so whoever the Democrats nominate is going to win this state in the landslide. So why waste my vote? Uh, I might as well vote it at least uh, for the guy that I like and just give him a symbolic uh, vote, you know, for the libertarian. Uh, but, you know, I tell you, on the Democratic side, I would, I, you know, as I would rather see Bernie Sanders than, than Hillary Clinton just because I really That's don't like him. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I think he's going to be good for the country. I just don't want Hillary to be president. I don't want Bill Clinton to be the first gentleman. And I think that <laughs> Bernie Sanders is probably – an honest guy. I mean, he's completely wrong about what he believes, but I do believe he's sincere. I think he's genuine. I, I don't trust Hillary Clinton at all. I think she's a crook. Now, you know, maybe it's better to have a crook as president than just somebody who's completely ignorant of economics. 
But I don't really know that a lot of what uh, Bernie Sanders wants to do is going to get passed anyway. I mean, I don't really think most of his stuff has a snowball's chance of getting through Congress anyway. So we just got to get through eight, you know, four years of it if he wins. And, you know, I don't even know which one of them is more beatable, whether it's uh, Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton. But, you know, at least with Bernie Sanders, you know, you know what you get. He's not an in the closet socialist. He's, you know, he's wearing it on his <laughs> sleeve. He's telling everybody, yeah, I'm a socialist. And uh, and so when his policies don't work, we know that it's socialism that's not working t- to the extent that he gets any of it. You know, and he likes to, curiously enough, you know, he holds out Sweden as an example of, you know, how he wants to remake America. Right. He wants to remake it in the Swedish model. And I wish he actually understood the Swedish history, because everybody who wants to talk about the middle way in Sweden and how great it is. Look, Sweden became wealthy before it adopted all those ridiculous socialist policies. And Over time, the Swedes began to realize and resent these policies because now they look at the the moral hazards and the, you know, the way these policies breed a culture of dependency and way they undermine economic growth. And Sweden got itself into a lot of trouble because of all the socialism that crept into an otherwise free society. And they have been trying to roll it back. And I would like to see even more progress. But I know that the Swedes eliminated their inheritance tax. That is the exact opposite of what Bernie Han- Sanders wants to do. They have a lower corporate tax rate in Sweden than we have in America. Uh, and so Sweden is going in the other direction. And, and, and so that's the lesson from Sweden. It's not that socialism works. It's that it doesn't work. But that once you have it, even if you know it doesn't work, it's hard to get rid of it. Yeah, we haven't dropped socialism totally, believe me. We, I think Per Byland wrote an essay about how Sweden, exactly the thing you're saying, Sweden got rich before socialism, and then we got socialism, and uh, my favorite statistic is real wages didn't increase for 25 years under socialism, uh, while the rest of the world went forward. Uh, So the problem now is uh, Sweden is such a mess politically, there's no, people don't even discuss economics because everybody is so busy with other issues. Um, But I mean, Sweden is... Somebody calculated that if still, if, if Bernie Sanders ran for election in Sweden, he would not be considered left wing at all because we're still, you know, the, the way we discuss politics is so far left, even if we've taken a few steps to the right. So <laughs> Bernie Sanders would be at, at worst a sort of middle of the world kind candidate like a moderate. in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a moderate. I mean, then, I mean, I guess Swedes, we discuss politics one way, but everybody really wants lower taxes, except, uh, but, but, you know, politicians never, you know, talk about lowering taxes. They just do it because it's good for the yeah. GDP sometimes. And a lot of it has to do with the education system and the way, you know, people learn. I mean, people have to understand that their best hope for a prosperous future doesn't lie in government or a government program. That government is a force of power. It's it's force. And it's more dangerous than it is helpful. That if you really want uh, to have the best shot of having the most prosperity, then it's economic freedom that you want. It's freedom from government. It's the fewer laws, the fewer regulations uh, that, that, are, that actually act as roadblocks. That if we just keep government as small as possible, then individuals collectively can work together in pursuit of their own self-interest, but through the invisible hand, uh, raise the standard of living of everybody else. Because, you know, as an as a business person or an entrepreneur, the only way that you can get rich is to try to figure out how to satisfy the desires and the needs of somebody else. And the better you can do that, uh, the richer you're going to be. The more products that you can provide at higher quality and lower price, the more jobs you can create, the more wealth that you're going to amass for yourself. Government doesn't work that way. You know, government, you know, government doesn't have to win your business because they offer you the best product at the lowest price. They just force you to do what they want. They have the gun, the point of a gun. They can say, you know, you have to do this and we're going to take your money. Right. A business has to earn your money. They have to encourage you to spend your money on their goods or services. Governments just take your money. You have no choice. And, and, and if you don't give it to them, they, they can put you in jail. Right. So this is what people have to fear. They have to fear government. But government has been successful in fooling people into thinking what they have to fear is other people and especially other people who decide to start a business or form a corporation. And that somehow that the government is going to protect them from all these evil other people that are somehow going to harm them when the real evil is government. And that theory needs to be you know, vanquished so that people understand 
uh, where prosperity comes from and, and, and what is the biggest enemy to prosperity, which has always been historically government. And you don't get that view when you go to uh, government schools. And uh, the way things are in Sweden, they own the entire school system. Uh, yep. There's a national curriculum which teaches children to fear other people and businesses and uh, look to government to save them from all these evils. And that's one of the reasons that I don't like government being involved in schools at all. I think schools should be run privately, uh, not by the government. You know, in the United States, we have public schools, too, and all that. But if you go back to our Constitution, the word education is not there. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It wasn't in the Declaration of Independence. It's not in the Constitution. Neither is the word school. Right. We, all, we, our founding fathers didn't want the governments providing schooling because it, they believed that education was important. And because it was important, they didn't want the government to do it. They want the, the free market to do it. Look, you know, we don't want the government to grow our food. We don't want the government to you know, make our clothing for us. We don't want the government to be in charge of consumer electronics. We want the free market coming up with innovative products. We know that if the government is in charge, I mean, what happened? Put the, look what happened in the Soviet Union, right? What, what, did, they, what did they come up with? What, what did, you, know, you remember those cars that they had in East Germany? Those, uh, the, 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 the one car that they made? Trabant. Right? Yeah, the Trabant. You ever see one of those things? That's government, <laughs> cre- that's what you get. Look at all the cars that we got out of West Germany, right? Look at BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, right, Audi, all these cars that private companies made in West Germany and look at that crappy little car that the government made in East Germany. That's the difference between capitalism and and, and socialism. And so we, that's the kind of education you get from government. You get that stubby, right? That's, that's government education in a car, right? I don't want that. I want, I want our kids, you know, in, in, in Mercedes and BMWs, not those little commie mobiles. And so if we had, Freedom, right? We'd have better education and our kids would not be indoctrinated, you know, uh, to, to believe in government. But government wants to perpetuate its own existence. So it, it, it basically indoctrinates our kids under the guise of educating them. And so they basically indoctrinate these little robotic voters that'll keep, you know, keep these socialists in power. And if, you know, no more call me mobiles then. And the way it works is anybody that wants to criticize this, criticize these failed government schools, oh, you're anti education, you're anti kids. No, the people who are anti education and anti kids are the proponents of government education. The only way to really educate our kids is to let the free market do it. And it's not like they'll say, well, if that's the case, poor people won't have education. Well, poor people, ha- poor people eat in capitalist countries. In fact, they eat better than they do under socialist countries where they're all starving. I mean, poor people benefit from better clothing, better better health care, better everything under capitalism than they do under socialism. And they'd have better under, better education if we let the market provide it rather than government. You know what happens in Sweden if you try to homeschool your children? What? They take your kids and put you in prison. <laughs> yeah, well, at least they don't no, do that No, it's actually America. true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's horrifying, horrifying. Um, But at least, you know, at least we got the internet in Sweden and people can listen to programs like this and they can go to my, you know, they can go to my websites, they can go to Shift Radio or my YouTube channel, they can listen to my podcast, my video blogs, they can read books. There's all, you know, you can find out about books that you wouldn't even know existed probably if it wasn't for the internet. And you can read Austrian economics and find out about that school of thought. And, and then, and, you know, ultimately, I think the government can't break this. The truth is going to come out. It's just taken a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're actually quite popular here in Sweden, among, at least among libertarians. Uh, your famous yeah. uh, P- we just the need, Peter Schiff was right video. <laughs> we uh, just need more libertarians. That's all. Look, I'm yeah. invest- I've got some money invested in Sweden. You know, look, as I said, at least the pendulum is swinging in the right direction, right? It just needs to swing a little faster. And I think it will. <laughs> But you're, it, it's happening. I mean, look, look, look what happened in New Zealand. New Zealand is a perfect example because New Zealand was probably to the left of Sweden at one point. New Zealand had even more government, bigger social welfare state, and they completely imploded. They went broke. You know, you go back and get an old encyclopedia, you know, from the 1970s. And they, oh, these liberals, they, they, they were so in love with New Zealand and, you know, how, how they were so progressive and they did all this stuff and they bankrupted the country. Look at New Zealand today, because the reason New Zealand is where it is today is because they abandoned all that nonsense. 
They got rid of their capital gains tax and their inheritance tax. They got rid of their minimum wage. They got rid of government guaranteed bank accounts. They privatized industries. They freed up the labor markets. They did all sorts of stuff, although I think they've got some of it back. I still think they have a minimum wage now. But most of the re- most of the reforms are still there, and they have much lower taxes now uh, than they used to have. They have lower taxes than the United States uh, by far. In fact, not only is there no capital gains tax, they don't even have double taxation on corporate dividends. It's only one level of taxation, so they dramatically reduced the corporate tax burden. Uh, and so now the New Zealand economy is in great shape. I mean, it's in much better shape now than it was when uh, the socialists were running it. And, uh, and so that's the example that we have to look at. When you see, hey, what happens when you have a lot of socialism, you go bankrupt, and the only salvation is to abandon those failed principles and embrace free market reforms, which is what under Roger Douglas they did in New Zealand. And incidentally, he was in the Labor Party. It was the, it was the very party that led them into that abyss that actually made the changes necessary to get out of it. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, Joachim, who was one of the co-founders of the Swedish Mises Institute, actually said, screw this, I'm going to New Zealand, and moved from Sweden to New Zealand. (laughs) Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. We know you're very busy, and uh, we know our listeners will be uh, delighted to hear you. Peter can, of course, be found on YouTube, shiftradio.com, shiftbooks.com, and his businesses can be found at europac.com and shiftgold.com. Europacificbank.com also. For the Swedes. For yes. Swedes, if you want to do business, <laughs> europacbank.com. Yeah. Anything, anything else you want to add about your, uh, here's the time to do all shameless, shameless plugs. Yeah, well, the website is europacbank.com, but the, the name of the company is europacificbank.com. But uh, yeah, and you know, I, you know, we pioneered the gold and silver back debit cards over there. So for people that uh, want to have gold and silver and then want the ability, if they need to, to spend it uh, with, a, with a credit card, they, they could do that. But yeah, and also, yeah, you mentioned my, my latest book that's out there is uh, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, How to Save Yourself and Your, and your Country. That book, uh, I revised it a couple of years ago, but it's as pertinent, I think, today as the day it was originally re- re- uh, written, uh, let alone revised. So that's a good one. All right, great. Klaus, any final words? No, nope. I think we are very grateful for Peter coming to our show, our humble show. <laughs> yeah, sure. all right. That all was right. episode 77. Thanks, Peter. All right, take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This episode is clipped and mixed by CF Ljud. For clipping, mixing or ljudförbättring, go to cfljud.com.